الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Indeed, all praise is due to Allah and my peace and blessings be upon his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Tonight is a special session before we start with our Aqeedah course next week, inshallah. Tonight it will be about something which is related to the Aqeedah, but it is because of the occasion we needed to special specialize or designate the night for tackling an issue that is the issue of celebrating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and we try as well to do what the Salaf used to do that is to find, first of all scrutinize the issue and also try to refute all the shubuhat and the doubts that the other side they say and we're going to treat it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to treat anything with just <coughs> first of all a uh, number of years ago, the London radio, which is directed towards the Muslim countries, Radio of London, which is uh, a very powerful too, uh, until very recently when other channels came in and there was a competition. But at the, before, lots of people even they used to depend upon that station, which is the London station, which is directed towards the Middle East, it's in Arabic, and at the same time, lots of people take it as to be almost as, you know, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, because of, that is, the most of the uh, radio stations and the broadcasters there, at that time they were liars, and the one that proves to be always truthful is the one coming from London. And I used to as well listen to my grandmother, who she says, I, I only trust London, uh, uh, broadcasting. So that is the case. So they said in that, uh, in one of the years when Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz <coughs> was to be the head of the Kibar al Ulama, and uh, he is the one who was in charge of the refutation, most of the refutation regarding the people of Ahl Bid'ah or the secularist, in which they have quoted, they said that Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, he makes takfir upon the person who celebrate the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And of course, that was purposely broadcasted for the purpose of making all the Muslims who are <coughs> unaware, all the Muslims who are already have a background that these are people of Wahhabis, that is to have, to develop a hatred towards them so they will never listen to them. And uh, such, of course, uh, uh, news and information is absolutely wrong. And we never ever heard our scholars, whether it is the scholars or the da'i, they say that the person who will celebrate the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is to be a kafir. A'udhu billah. Even maybe the takfiri people haven't reached that stage. The takfiri people, they haven't reached that stage. So to say that we, the ones who are subhanAllah, it's unjust. Wallah, it is unjust. Sometimes they label us to be takfiri and sometimes they label us to be cowards and takfiri. I don't know which one is which. Either we are making takfir upon the people who celebrate the birth of the Prophet of Allah or the ones who are so coward they don't make takfir upon the rules or rule by other laws of Allah. I don't know which one is which. So this is just to do with the lies and fabrication. And I would never be surprised that if that news was from the uh, Rafidah, who are trying to, Rafidah means the Shia, they call it the Rafidah, who are trying to, uh, to sort of uh, make Saudi Arabia to be the focus for hatred and as well because Saudi Arabia uh, in most of its uh, verdicts that would they all the time try to fight the uh, innovations and to fight as well any shirk sort of things like uh, rotating around the graves and so on and so forth because of that the Rafidah they don't like it so they wanted the help of the Westerners uh, against the proper Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and we as well have heard our Sheikh Abu Bakr al Jazari, one of the great du'ads in Al Madina. He says a person came to him and said that I hate somebody because he's all the time rejecting the celebration of the birth of the Prophet. So he said, I can never stop wondering. 
can never stop being amazed. The person who is denying the innovation, the person who is telling the people you should abandon the innovation, the Muslims would hate him. It's supposed to be the other way around. Muslims are supposed to be loving him. It's not supposed to be hating them. And the person as well, more as well astonishing of, than that, is that it is that they say uh, between the Muslims, they make it prevalent, that the ones who deny the celebration of the birth of the Prophet are the ones who hate the Prophet And you've heard this before. The ones who, for example, tell the Mu'addin not to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to add it to the Adam, what is it is supposed to be to the people who hear, or the Mu'addin himself, but you cannot say it loudly. Don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after that loudly. They say those are the ones who hate the Prophet of Allah. This is, I would say, an accusation. Uh, it's been uh, thrown at us. Not now, it's a long time ago. Even from the last, uh, you could say, days of the Ottomans, when they were, uh, the Sufis were in control. And they were trying to spread rumors at the time of Imam Muhammad al-Wahhab. Because some of uh, <coughs> his followers prevented a number of caravans who were heading towards the Kaaba. And instead of saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, they were chanting other chants. So they either you say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, or there is no way for you to go to Hajj. And since that time, they started saying, I was spreading these rumors that these people hate. Okay, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they don't like, they don't like you to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They prevent you from celebrating the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of those lies never stopped until today. So it is an old, new, okay, accusation. An old and new. And it's not going to stay until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. So uh, it's something you should not really be uh, astonished with. That is it's something is all the time repeating itself. And I would say this is a big crime. It's a crime that is coming out from somebody who claims to be believing in Allah on the last day. That how can you say that we, when we say such an issue, we hate the Prophet sallallahu Because the hatred of the Prophet sallallahu is a clear cut kufr. So I'm going to treat you like the way you treat me or say to me I'm a kafir. If, I'm, if you're saying to me that I am saying this because we hate the Prophet of Allah, that means what has got to do with me with this land if I hate the Prophet of Allah? So how can you accuse me of such a thing? So we say first of all, the celebration in the occasion of the birth of the Prophet which comes to be in the Rabi' al-Awwal. Today, according to your timetable, is it the 9th of Rabi' al-Awwal? When was the first day on your calendar, Rabbi Allah? Can you just tell me, please? No, no, it's not Maghrib. Talk about tonight. Maghrib. Huh? Wednesday. No, it's supposed to be Tuesday. This is wrong. Tuesday was the first. Okay, Tuesday was the first. Maybe this is based upon the citation before it was cited. This is a poor estimation, but every month we should be really checking. It was actually the first was the Tuesday, and today will be the ninth. Instead of the eighth, it's the eighth years, isn't it? Yeah, it will be ninth, the ninth. The ninth of the month of Rabi' al Awwal, the year is 1433 after migration. Um, we say in general, first of all, this is a celebration which is in general, and this is not in detail. In general, this is a celebration, hasn't been practiced by the Prophet, وسلم, never in, encouraged by the Prophet. وسلم, and never been done by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, never been encouraged by the companions, and also I could just go all the way up to the followers, and the followers of the followers, up to the 4th century, which is the year 360, all of those years, they've never heard about this cold celebration of the birthday of the Prophet So It's about 300 years plus after the Prophet yet, the Muslims never heard about this celebration of the birth of the Prophet You could say that as in general, it's a relaxation and to start from that. Number two is that this celebration is being done either because of people who are ignorant. So the first reason are ignorant, they don't know. And they wanted to, you know, show their love to the Prophet of Allah. Or other people who are, they know. And those are the ones who they actually uh, read in between the lines. They don't read properly. And they twist the text. And they try to come out with a bid'ah. 
and those are the most, most of these, in the, the followers of that clan, or number two, is the Sufis. Or the third ones, are, those are the ones who are just basically, they don't know. So they just, basically, they have no idea. So we have number one, the ones who are ignorant, the follow, they think this is the, and number two, the ones who know, knowledgeable, and number three, the ones who do not know. So they are really standing here, they don't know. And that is, I would say, the number three comes into it as well, the states and the countries who are the ones, for example, they say, well, we just look at the majority of the people are happy with, you know, setting a celebration for the birth, let's just do it. And they encourage it and they pay money for it and so on and so forth. So those are the, and our admonition today and our circle today and our lecture symposium today is targeting all these three groups. But most, I would say the most is number one, the ignorant, because... Most likely, number two, they're already made up their mind, they're not going to follow except what they have set for themselves to follow. And we will tell you what is the reason they have set for themselves to follow such a route. Okay? Uh, so number one is the most target. Number three, inshallah, they could hear listen to us, they've got time for us. Uh, they, the celebration in general is actually, they are imitating, those people are imitating the Christians when they celebrate the birth of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, or the birth of their Lord, God. So we see that the ignorant Muslims, or even the deviant scholars, in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, uh, in the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, they, in every year, they celebrate the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Some of them, they would make the celebration in the masjids, some of them, they make it in the house, and some of them, they make it in, in specific, specific halls, even on TVs at the moment, and so many people who are ignorant would come to those gatherings and celebrations. And uh, on top of being a celebration, we have as well, uh, which is a bid'ah, and on top of as well being imitation to the Christians, we find as well lots of shirkiyat, lots of munkarat, things which Allah is not pleased with them, goes into these celebrations, like for example, the mixing between men and women. And I have as well here a footage, a recording, where there was a celebration, <coughs> not the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, but actually the birth of uh, Sayyidina Rifari. Rifari is one of the people who are they, they say that he is a holder of the flag of the Prophet of Allah. So in which uh, Egypt, they have a day, the Sufi Egyptians there, they have a day for him, and they celebrate men and women, they dance together, and when the man was asked, how can you, you know, justify men and women? It's like a disco, you know, basically. This is like a disco. Dude. How can you justify such an issue? He says that only the souls are dancing, not the bodies, brother. That's what he say. The souls. So you're not coming with your body, you're coming with your spirit. So the spirit are dancing, not the body. So and that's how he justifies it. So we find as well, nasheeds, a'udhu billah, in it, those nasheeds. The, 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 the rhymes they bring, they have too much gulu in the Prophet to the, to, the, I would say to the level they would say he knows what goes into the preserved tablet. And that is what? Only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they say as well that this Prophet وسلم, he is the one who would, you know, for example, he is the one <coughs> that he will, uh, uh, he's alive at the moment. And not only that, he is the one to say that you are the hell to the fire. He is the one to be supplicated by Misal Allah Azza wa Jalla. And all of those goes into the uh, celebrations, which is part of the shirks. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he forbade us from going extreme in his praising him, which we're going to see, inshaAllah. La tutuni kama atatim nasara ibn Maryam. That is, don't praise me like in the way that the Christian had praised the son of Maryam, that is Isa alayhi salam. Innama ana abdullah, verily, I am Abd, Fakulu Abdullahi wa Rasulun. So say, the slave of Allah, the messenger of Allah. This is narrated by Al Bukhari and Muslim. And the people as well who come to the celebration, some of them they would believe as well. This is a general. They believe that the Prophet himself would come and participate in such festival. And that's why they leave a chair. And there's nobody sitting there. They believe that the Prophet would sit on that chair. And if you call it in Arabic, Hadra. Hadra from Hadra. Hadra is he came. Hadra is like the present. The Prophet ﷺ is coming to witness and participate in such festival. So some of them, they would have the such 
uh, aqidah and such belief. Um, we have as well drummings. I don't know if you've heard about, you've seen, you must have seen as well drums, uh, tambourine, tambourine plus drums as well, and some of them as well. Uh, the music, the background music, as long as it's a music, as one of their scholars had said, like uh, Al Qaradawi, he says that the, the music, if it's old, or, uh, as long as it's not rock and roll, uh, it's no problem to have music in the background. Musiqa uh, sahiba, he says. Musiqa sahiba. Sahiba means, you know, I don't know what sahiba means, like uh, it's a provoking music. As long as, I don't know what's a non provoking music. Maybe he's a classical person, so he likes classic music. Okay, so classic music with it, there's no problem with that. And all of these things, you know, goes on into such festivals, and uh, this is bid'ah, definitely. And in general, and every a innovation is a misguidance, and every misguidance will lead to the hellfire. <coughs> and uh, we say it is a bid'ah because, in general, that the book had not mentioned it, the Sunnah did not mention it, the Salaf did not do it, not even those centuries where the Prophet ﷺ, he said Al-Qurun Al-Mufaddala, the best of centuries, that is his own century, and the following one, and the following one, and another generation, even the following one, that's we've got four centuries. <coughs> so all of that up to the year 300 years, we've got these people that are the best, they haven't done it, but it's actually after the fourth century. This is just to show you that it happened after the century, which is that was the Prophet ﷺ, he said, another hadith, fourth but after the 4th century, this is not, so within the 4th century we have the best, we have, they could say, the righteous Salaf. Not every single person living at that time is righteous, except for the companions. But we say, in general, those that, that this is the time when we refer to it, that the best of the centuries. But after those best, best of centuries have passed, we have this innovation, which is called Al-Ihtifal Bil-Mawlid, celebrating the birth. And it's been done by the Fatimiyun, the ones who are called themselves the Fatimis, and they are, uh, you could say, hardcore uh, uh, Shia. Actually, they are worse than the Rafidah. And even the scholars had agreed that these people are not Muslims. They are even, they don't call it a Dawla Fatimiyah in Egypt, they call it the uh, Dawla al Ubaidiyah. Also, they call it the Dawla al Majusiya, the major country, so the fire worshippers. They're not really uh, Muslims. Al Imam Abu Hafs, Tajuddin al Fakahani, he says in his uh, treatise, which is Risalat al Mawlid, Al Mawrid, Fi Amal al Mawrid, that is uh, the, the, the translation of the title is in that treatise of his. Uh, is talking about the celebration of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu He said, it was a number of people who had questioned me regarding the uh, celebration that some of the people they embark upon in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, calling it the celebration of the birth. Is it uh, connected to the religion? Has it got a proof? And they intended for me to explain. So I would say, and uh, on Allah I uh, depend. He says, I have no knowledge of any origin of such celebration in the book nor into the sunnah and it never been transferred to us from any of the scholars of the ummah those are the ones who used to be the ones to look at and to emulate and to follow the ones who are hooking and holding onto the traces of the predecessors it is actually a bid'ah which the ones who are innovators had innovated it and it's based upon whims and desire and actually had been used by those people who want to make money they have used it uh, in, for their favor and you know for sure some people that wait for those moments either to <coughs> bring his bandits and show his voice <coughs> and you know get money and uh, for example in the name of the prophet وسلم, they would gather a lot of donations and you find their peers and so on and so forth are living on such occasions. That's what the scholar says. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says in Iqtida al Sirat al Mustaqim, he says, and whatever happens from the people regarding the Rabi al Awwal, it is actually trying to imitate the Christians when they celebrate the birth of Isa alayhi salam. And uh, he says, this is not, hasn't been done by the Salaf, and it was, if it was good, then the Salaf would have done it. And because they were more of love to the Prophet of Allah. They were loving the Messenger of Allah more than anybody else. 
and they used to have sheer reverence toward the Prophet ﷺ more than anybody else. And they have eagerness more than anybody else to gather the good. So if they haven't done it, it is not supposed to be done. And he says, actually, the love of the Prophet of Allah and showing reverence to him is only by following him and obeying his commands and revival of his sunnah, whether it's inwardly or outwardly, and to spread around whatever he had came up with, what has been revealed to him from the jihad and so on and so forth, that is, with the heart and the hand and the tongue. This is the way of the predecessors of the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and those who follow them in righteousness. And actually it was, uh, I mean, lots of treaties and lots of books had been compiled in that issue regarding the bid'ah and so on and so forth. Now, after all of that, we come to the details. How do we, first of all, start with tackling such an issue? And we're gonna make as well a refutation as well to one of those dua to Sufism called Al Jafri, and I'm naming him because so most of you don't know him. Al Jafri. I don't know. Who knows him? Put your finger up, please. Oh, Alhamdulillah, nobody knows him. If you're an Arab, here, all of you will be knowing him. Al Jafri? Okay, Alhamdulillah. Then I will just bring his argument because his argument basically is the arguments used by most of the Sufis to say that the celebration of the birth is to be legalized. So I'll bring his argument and I will refute it as well. So, uh, uh, and he is a tantalizing person. He, is play, he plays with the emotions and that is why he's so good at it. And some people uh, who have been listening to me regarding this issue, they'll be shocked. You're talking about a man whom I love. I'd love to watch and I'd love to listen. You're talking about this person? How come? And uh, this is what the people have used. Uh, those people who are deviant, you know, dua, they have actually used their eloquent speech, which is type of magic. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْبَيَانِ That is, some of the speech are to be magic. When they speak to you, they speak to your heart. They Actually, I just really describe them like these people. They take your, the, the, your heart out of your body and they keep laying with it around, whatever they want, and they push it back to, to you. And you don't know what is happening. And that's why the people are baffled. And when they come out, they are totally brainwashed. Why? Because of the magic of the words. But if they actually scrutinize these words, expose them to the look and the sunnah and to the deeds of the Salaf al-Ummah, those words will fall down. Nothing. They are empty. They have no knowledge. So the person who is educated, knowledge-wise, he is secure. But I'm talking to those people who are vulnerable. So many people amongst us are so vulnerable. And not only vulnerable, they like to be vulnerable. Not ignorant, but they like to insist to be ignorant and to live ignorant. And they say, I've got nothing to do with that. No, it is incumbent upon you. That is to know your religion. There is no such thing in our religion called ignorance. Ignorance is a bid'ah. You should not be an ignorant person. You should be a knowledgeable person. I'm not saying you should be a scholar. You should be a knowledgeable person. So when you worship Allah, you worship Allah with knowledge. You don't worship Allah like that. How come that if you are a person who want to make money and you to, to trade in a certain, for example, issue, a certain good, you make your best to ask about how profitable is that good? Where it is the best selling, where to sell it, how who to sell it, you'll be the best in that, you'll investigate. When it comes to your religion, you do nothing. You're going to be questioned about that. Why? Why are you still insisting to be ignorant? Why? Subhanallah. I'm not talking about, mashallah, the people come here and they want to listen. But there are lots of people, double and triple you. They just don't want to listen. So it is not the problem that you are being ignorant. Because if you're being ignorant and you are recognizing that, and you're coming to terms, Alhamdulillah, I'm an ignorant, I want to educate myself. But the problem with is that person who is ignorant and he doesn't know that he's ignorant. He doesn't know that he's ignorant. Or he's insisting to stay ignorant. Or he thinks he's knowledge when he's not. SubhanAllah, knowledge only can be sought by being humble. If you're going to be arrogant on top of the knowledge, the knowledge would leave you. And it will come nothing to, to do with you. Right. So if it is the case, we need to be educated how to refute such shubuhat and nats. Because it's very easy to be a target for those people. 
if you now come out and listen to one of these people who are more, much more eloquent speaker than me, in English and Arabic and every language, and they're going to come to you with words, and you have nothing to really, subhanAllah, to fight them with. So how are you going to be, you know, protecting yourself? You're going to be protecting yourself with this information, inshallah. And I'll try to do my best to simplify what I'm going to tell you as much as possible. First of all, we would like to know in general what is the bid'ah and then divide the bid'ah. Bid'ah is innovation because a bid'ah is a very important issue. And you know for a fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, when he had received the ayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Arafah, it was the day of Jumu'ah, in his farewell hajj, he received it in Arafah. And that is the ayah, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلِكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Today, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ I accomplished for you, I completed for you my religion. Allah is saying to the Prophet of Allah. Completed for you, that means for you, O Muhammad, and the ones who are the followers of Islam. I completed for you my religion. And I accomplished for you my favors. And I chose Islam to be your religion. So by that verse... Religion is sealed. Deen is sealed. You can't add it. You can't subtract. There is no such thing that there is a revelation now that would say to you, you don't have to do the Fajr prayer. Or you don't have to do the Dhuhr prayer. That's nonsense. So the religion is complete before the Prophet ﷺ had died. And when the Messenger of Allah passed to the highest of companions, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had passed with the religion is complete. If you have no doubt about that, then there is something wrong with your understanding to Islam. So if it is the case, anything added after the death of his Prophet ﷺ, which hasn't been authenticated or approved by him, then it has to be put in the bin. Straight away, bin it. Or even look at it. So this is such a simple, I would say, argument or a simple equation you could use. Equation one, did the Prophet ﷺ do it? No. Flow chart now goes to this. Did the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, do it? No. Bin. Huh? Dustbin. Yes, you go to another flow chart. When and how they did it. When and how. Because it's very important. I want to know when they did they do it? How did they do it? Because if I don't understand, I'm going to end up doing something whether the Prophet did it, but in a different way. Like for example, Dhikr, remembrance of Allah. Did the Prophet ﷺ do it? Yes. Did the companions do it? Yes. Bin it? No one bin it. But how? When? How? The Prophet ﷺ used to do it individually. Ah, when? Well, the Prophet ﷺ, he would encourage general times, like for example, in the last third of the night, for example, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the when you are breaking your fast, and so on and so forth. And in general... <laughs> Okay, so did he specify a certain day like Mawlid? No, bin. Again, go to the bin. Then you know the bin? Go to the bin. If it's yes, yes, then we'll do it. So simple equations, if simple flowchart. Everything that you do, just do that questioning, you'll end up, alhamdulillah, on the safe side. al bidah In language, in language, in Arabic language, means bid'ah is something from, like, innovation. To, in, to, to innovate something, to invent, okay, to invent something is invention, and that is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, "Badiyu al-Samawati wal-Ard." He is the inventor of the heavens of earth, isn't he? He had invented because something hasn't been before, so it is for the very first time you have heavens and earth. Uh, he is the one who had in it. He has the one who created it. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says. For the, the problem, the tongue of the Prophet, he says, Qul ma kuntu min al Say to them, I did not, I was not to be the first person to come up with a message from Allah. But actually, this is the Prophet, but actually, that's lots of prophets had preceded me. So here, bid'am min al rusul, bid'am surat al ahqaf, bid'am that means the first, but I wasn't the first, I had lots of prophets coming before me with revelation. This ibtida' <coughs> is of two types. Ibtida'um fil adat, that is, when you make innovation, you make innovation in habits, like for example, adat, like in, for example, you do 
اختراق something which is to do with the, you know you invent a toolbox by which you could gather the money in a better way and more safer okay and this is permissible nothing to do with what we're going to talk about and the second one is to make a bid'ah in religion and that bid'ah in religion is totally forbidden because the big principle in that is what the Prophet ﷺ had said man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa min he who had into he had <coughs> innovated he had introduced something in our religion whatever is does not belong to it or man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna who had done a an act which hasn't been authenticated by us which is the Prophet ﷺ then it is rad rad means is to be rejected as for the types of the bid'ah, there are of two types. First type is to be the sayings of creeds, which is like the Jahmiya sayings, and the Mu'tazila sayings, and the Rafidah sayings. Like for example, we have the Jahmiya, <coughs> what said, the Quran is makhluq, the Mu'tazila had said, the Quran makhluq. Do you remember when we discussed that issue? All of those sayings are to be it is a bid'ah, it is in the science, and it is a, to do with the aqeedah. And the second time, it is a bid'ah in the ibadah. That is, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a certain worship, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give you the permission to do so. And this it can be divided into categories, which is, come under it, the bid'ah of the celebration of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. The first one, the first category, which is to do with the bid'ah in the ibadah. That is, which is, comes in the root of the ibadah. In the root of the ibadah. So he would, for example, innovate a prayer which it is totality, it is entirety, it's not there, hasn't been given by Allah or His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or a fast which is not there. So this comes into it as well, celebration of the birth of the Prophet sallam, but it has caused nothing from the origin of it, nothing. We can't really say anything that supports the origin of it or the weight because there's no celebration of the birth of the Prophet The second one is the one that you could say adding to a specific worship which has been legalized. Like for example, we have a fourth rakah, we make it a fifth rakah. So we pray in the dhuhr instead of paying it four, you pray it five. So this is addition. And the third type is the one that you make a uh, change into the way that this ibadah and this worship is performed. So for example, you're doing the adhkar that we have said is the adhkar of Allah, remembrance of Allah, in a way which hasn't been verified or authenticated by the Prophet ﷺ by doing it in number of people and also unto melodies and so on and so forth. The fourth type is the person who had made a specific worship which is legalized by the Prophet ﷺ, by making a specific time for it. So for example, to designate the 15th of Sha'ban, Shabarat, you remember Shabarat? That is to worship Allah with extra worship and to fast the day of the 15th of Sha'ban, or for example, to make a Qiyam on the night that precedes Friday, or to make a Qiyam on the night that precedes the Eid. All of those are making a specific type of worship in a time which is being, hasn't been authenticated by Allah and His Messenger, by the Sharia itself. So all of these are to be the categories comes under the second type, which is the bid'ah into the worship. So we how many types of worship? The bid'ah into we have bid'ah number one, which is the qawliya i'tiqadiyya, the sayings and the creed, and number two, the bid'ah in the ibadat, and that comes into four categories, which we have explained. Alhamdulillah. Now all the bid'ahs, which are in the religion, with all its types. All the bid'ahs, whether the first type or the second type, all of them are to be haram, are to be misguidance. For the Prophet ﷺ, he said, الأمور, which is in the khutbat al hajah <coughs> be aware of the innovative acts, for every innovative act is an innovation, and every innovation is a misguidance. This is in Sunan Abi Dawood, and the hadith which is in Sahih al Bukhari. And one of the narration in Sahih Imam Muslim, he who does an act which is, hasn't been authenticated by me is to be rejected. All of that uh, and other hadith as well. I'm just giving you general uh, ayah and a hadith, a hadith and a hadith. If there is an ayah as well, I will give you the ayah, the verse, to show to you that all innovations in religion, regardless of its type, is to be haram. Now, 
So we we say the bid'ah in the ibadat and i'tiqadat is to be muharrama, but this uh, uh, being haram or being unlawful is actually as well into comes into ranks. Now we don't say, for example, when a person he makes let's say a car in the jama'ah with one voice with one melody is equivalent to a person who says al Quran makhluq the Quran is being created. Each one has come up with something that differs into how bad he had said it. So the worse it is. So for example, when we said the person who does this uh, first category, which is the, uh, the first type, which we said the innovated saying, which is to do with the aqidah, then this is like, is kufr. Like for example, <coughs> circumambidating the graves, which is you to get closer to the person who's in the grave. Or even, for example, slaughtering for the sake of the grave, or for vowing or seeking help and aid from those who are already dead. And like, for example, the Jahmiya sayings and the Mu'tazila sayings, all of that is to be kufr. Kufr is a clear cut kufr. Now, a person is a kafir or not, that's a different category. <coughs> Talking about the saying itself is to be a kufr. And also, all these things that would lead to such shirk, like, for example, building on top of the grave and worshipping Allah or supplicating to Allah but into the vicinity or the area of the grave all of that as well from the things that would lead to shirk also there are some of these bid'as which are to be considered to be fisk evil doing not to be kufr like for example the bid'a of the khawarij the bid'a of the qadariyya the bid'a of the murji'a and others so these are comes into the as well fiskun it is corruption or to be evil doing into the aqidah itself some of it is to be just only a sin. Like for example, the person who is not eating for the sake of getting closer to Allah, the person who is not uh, breaking his fast, is fasting every day, and the person, for example, who is praying the night, all nights and every night, and the person who is making, uh, detaching himself from the women all the time, all of that is, comes into the sin. And for the best book for that, you go to the I'tisam. Al-I'tisam, the Shatini, is the best book for that. And we have no doubt that the hook into the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet on the methodology of the Salaf is your salvation from going into bid'ah and into misguides. As for the Prophet had clarified this issue on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said the Messenger of Allah he drew a line for us and which was a line, it was a long one but straight. And then he said this is the path of Allah, this is Sabirullah. And then he had drew short lines on each side of that long straight line. And then he said those roots, those turuk, those khutut, those roots are to be the khutut of shaitan. And every root of it, there is a shaitan calling for it. And then he recited the verse, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّونَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ سُرْتِ الْعَامِ And that is the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is my path. And the Prophet was pointing to the middle path. I understand from that path, it is number one, it is one. Not one money path, it's only one. Number two is a long one. Because the person says, well, am I going to establish the Islamic State? Oh, I'm going to be waiting now and making tasfiyah and tarbiyah, filterization and bringing up the generation. And that's a long route. Let me just kill the leader and put a khalifa and that's it. Huh? That's a shortcut. A shortcut and that's it. Would it work? They said the small. So I understand as well from the drawing of the Prophet to those lines which came to us, the drawings, that the roots of shaitan are very what? Short, shortcuts. But the path of Allah, salvation is a long way. It's a long way. It takes a long way. It doesn't matter. As long as you're in the path, you don't have to wait. Number two, that you, you know from the lines of the shaitans are many. Shortcuts are many. But the path of Allah is only one. There's no repetition for that. So he who had detached himself from the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the manhaj, the salif, methodology of the salaf, then he is definitely upon the bid'ah and the misguidance. Now, here I would like to draw the attention of the brothers. He who divides the bid'ah to a bid'ah hasana and a bid'ah sayyah, good bid'ah and bad bid'ah, he is definitely mistaken. That is not to say maybe he's doing it deliberately. For verily the Prophet in every khutbah, 
in every sermon, in every weddings when he wed, he makes a speech which is Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu and then to the end Amma ba'd fa inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah wa ahsan al-hadhi hadhi muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa inna sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha wa inna kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa inna kulla bid'atin dalala wa inna kulla dalalati fina Translation of which that is the khutbat al-hadhi the addressing of meat in every wedding in every khutbat al-jum'ah in every lecture most likely would say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he said to proceed valley the best of talks is the book of Allah and the best of guidance is the guidance of his messenger Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him. And verily the most evil of all matters, the evil of all matters, are the ones innovated. For every newly innovated matter is an innovation. Bid'ah. And every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance of the helper. In Arabic, every means kul. Kul, 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 kul. So somebody comes, no, 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 not every bid'ah, not every bid'ah is to be misguidance. But the Prophet is saying all the time, Every bid'ah is a misguidance, and every misguidance, and you say, no, not every bid'ah. What are you trying to say to me? Are you a person who understands more Arabic than the Arabs? Or you've got something wrong with your ears? Or is it something that you want to build upon what you are trying to build upon <coughs> for the sake of whims and desire? And this is what we're going to find out. What are the reasons behind those innovators when they make their innovations? What are you trying to say to me? Prophet said, kul, kul, kul. He said, no, not kul, not kul. You are refuting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, and Al-Hafidh ibn Rajab, in his explanation of the 40 hadiths in his book, which is Jami'ul Ulum al-Hikam, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, every bid'ah balala, it's from the collective words, jawami al karim words which are few in number, but they've got huge meanings. Jawami al karim la yakhruju anhu shay. It is a governing principle. Nothing will escape that principle. Nothing. And it's a great principle from the principles of religion. And it's equivalent to the saying of the Prophet, he who does something in our matter, in our religion, which has not been authenticated, nothing coming from it, then it is rejected. So this is one of the usul. And the religion is got nothing to do with the deviations and the misguidance and the innovations. Whether these innovations in the aqidah or the actions, or the sayings, whether the inward or the outward. So they have no proof whatsoever for those people to say that there is a bid'ah hasana, except for the following, and I'm trying to refute this. <laughs> Number one, they say Umar al-Khattab in Surah al-Tarawih, he said, Ni'matul bid'ah. What a good bid'ah this is. And the second one, that there are things that happen after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu which the Salaf had approved, like, for example, gathering the Qur'an in one book. And, for example, get, writing the hadith. Writing it, documenting the hadith. So we're going to answer this. Number one, regarding the issue of, first of all, that is, all of these have been mentioned. It has a root in the Sharia. You say it hasn't been having a root. It has a root. That means it traces itself to something at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. As for Umar al-Khattab saying, Ni'matul bid'ah. This is what a good bid'ah. First of all, what does Umar mean by this? Does he mean bid'ah in religion or bid'ah as in something which is nice, which is the bid'ah al-lughawiyya, which is something that hasn't been preceded by him, but as in from the Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. You see what happened? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he himself one night came out of the house and he prayed his night prayer in the masjid. That was the 20 third night of Ramadan and some of the companions they saw him and they followed him and they made the prayer with him and then the 24th night he did not come out 25th night he came out but those people who prayed with him told other people huh there is the prophet son he prayed a prayer whenever he seen him praying so there's more people praying on the 25th night and those people who came on the 25th night they told others the 26th night did not pray the prophet son 27th night he comes out of the masjid. And Aisha she says, That is, the masjid was full of people on the 27th night. And the Prophet وسلم, prayed almost close to the Fajr. And he said, some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah just really extended into the Fajr. So he left. On the 28th night, 
He did not come up. 29th line, there was people more than the masjid itself. So lots of people, more than the 27th line. Because they've heard about the prayer of the Prophet And the Messenger of Allah stayed in his room where he could hear what is going on. And he knows. And he knows. It's just next to it's just a wall between him and them. And they're waiting. And they're waiting. From the time of Isha, they were waiting until Fajr. And the Prophet did not come out. He's still waiting inside. And even some of those new companions that embrace Islam, they want, you know, they don't have the sort of the same etiquettes as the other okay, companions. They're not like senior companions. So they just, you know, because the masjid's got pebbles. So some of them, they got the pebbles. And the door of the Prophet ﷺ leads to the masjid. So they threw it in the door. Like that. Huh? They threw it. You still, you, why they threw it? They want to know if the Prophet ﷺ is asleep. He's not aware. They threw some pebbles. And definitely the Prophet would have just, you know, uh, sort of uh, inquisitively, he would ask what is happening. But nothing happened. And they waited. And waited. Prophet came out. And he addressed them with that. He prayed them with the Fajr, led them in the Fajr prayer, and thereafter the Fajr, he addressed them. He said, I know what took place last night. I know what he did. That means he was waiting for me. But I was afraid that this prayer becomes compulsory upon you. This is from the mercy of the Messenger of Allah. Verily, you are to the believers, Ra'uf and Rahim. Subhanallah. If he had continued, it would have been compulsory on us. Now, with the seal of the religion that we have mentioned, which is the ayah al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, on the Hajj, which is the Hajj, the farewell Hajj. After that, this fear, is it still there or is it gone? Is it gone? Because there is no fear now. If we're going gonna to do this jama'ah, why? Because the religion had sealed. It's being finished, com completed. So in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, there was the people, even at the time of the Prophet sallallahu himself, after that night, the companions did not pray after behind one imam. They used to pray you know, like individually or some little groups here and there. In the time of Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr led only two and a half years. And he was busy with the apostasy. <coughs> <coughs> so they were praying the same in Ramadan until Umar al-Khattab comes. At the beginning, even still nothing. But later on, he looks, he comes to the Masajid, and he is all the time coming to the Masajid to see what's happening. And he saw them in Ramadan praying, you know, in little groups. He said, if I just bring them behind one Imam. He wants to revive the Sunnah of the Prophet. He's not making an innovation here, he's making a revival. A revival to the Sunnah. So he said, and on and, 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 and top of Let's say he's making something new. Okay? If those companions had agreed upon it, it becomes religion. Because the Prophet said, My ummah will never combine upon dalala, upon misguidance. You understand that? And that's why we have the ijma, the consensus, is the consensus of the companions. If they have consensus, that means unanimous decision. Not unanimous. Full agreement. Then whatever they have agreed upon is not going to be dalala. It has to be part of the religion. So this is just for the sake of the argument. But actually the Prophet ﷺ had started that. But he did not want to do it again because it would have been fard on us, compulsory upon us. So Umar al-Khattab revived the sunnah did not create a bid'ah wallahu ta'ala. As for the gathering of the Qur'an in one book, which happened at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and later on happened at the time of Uthman radiallahu an. That gathering in between two, between two, we could say, covers. We have, then we have an origin for that from the Sharia, because, <coughs> because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to command to write the Quran every time the Quran is revealed. He would make sure that those uh, scribes would write it down. But this writing was scattered all over the place. So the companions, what they've done, they gathered those, you know, those writings and put it in one book for the sake of preserving it. So where is the bid'ah into that? The companions already had written, the companions written the Quran in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. But in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, number one, there was not the, the sort of the facilities of papers. You used to pray, for example, they used to write on uh, sheepskins, on the bark of a tree, huh? on a stone. So if you want to gather a Quran, you need a, a big masjid like this just for one Quran. Because you're going to have a rock here, you're going to have a sheepskin there, you're going to have bark of a tree here, you're going to have trunk of a tree here. This is impossible to gather one Quran into like we have our Mus'haf in these days. So the facilitation came later on in the time of Uthman. Anh, have you seen the Quran of Uthman 
رضي الله عنه. It's not that thick. It's that thick. Huh? So because of the, uh, the papers of that time, they were really, uh, you know, card boxes. They were not really like our thin papers at the moment. So like that. So imagine the time of Umar, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu There was no papers. So it is not a bid'ah because it's already been done by the Prophet Sallallahu and the Messenger of Allah. Though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, he would have never objected to such an issue because remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, min ba'di. Follow the ones who are after me. Abu Bakr and Umar. Just Abu Bakr and Umar, he they themselves, they had agreed upon something, they followed them. So where is the bid'ah? You telling me you are Abu Bakr and Umar when you animated this celebration of the Mawlid, the birth? You're not Abu Bakr and Umar, are you? It's Abu Bakr and Umar and all the companions. And Abu Bakr radiallahu an, when Umar al-Khattab came to him to ask him for the, this Quran gathering, he said to him that we have lots of reciters, half of them have been killed. In Harb al yamama lots of them have been killed. And by the way, there's not a lot of people from the companions had memorized the Quran. Very, not really that much. Most of them, they have part of the Quran, but not all of the Quran. So they also far, they were in the front lines in the apostasy war because they are, because the Quran is in their chest. SubhanAllah, they want to sacrifice themselves. So because of that, he came to Abu Bakr, he said, this is danger. We have to do something about it. He said, how can I do something? It wasn't happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But Umar, just like I'm convincing you about this, he's convincing Abu Bakr. Until Allah made it sort of nice and good in Abu Bakr. Tell me you are Abu Bakr's heart. This is Abu Bakr's heart. The one, the one who had asked one of his servants to go and get something. And he gave him the food. And then he said, this is from sorcery. The source of that food, I bought it from the money of a sorcery. Okay, and it was only one Muslim came inside. What he did, he just put his hand, <laughs> take it out. He says, you solely think this is just because, he said, Wallahi, if it takes all my life, I'll take it out. I will never even let one morsel of haram go <coughs> inside my money. So Abu Bakr, you're not talking about yourself. You can't be like Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr was relaxed with this. Umar was relaxed. And then they called Zayd. Ibn Thabit. Zayd ibn Thabit, he is to be the head of the committee of gathering the Quran. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu arda is a great companion. He knows Abu Bakr and Umar they're to be followed. When they said to him, you know, about the gathering of the Quran, he said exactly the same words as Abu Bakr. But Abu Bakr never said to him, didn't the Prophet say to you, follow the ones who are after me, Abu Bakr and Umar? We are Abu Bakr and Umar. Come on. They didn't say that. They started to explain to him, explain to him. Already Abu Bakr is convinced. Now he went to convincing Zayd. And he was convinced. They're not doing a bid'ah. He says the Prophet would have done it. So what they've done, all of them, they have gathered and then Zayd ibn Thabit had chosen some a committee to check on the Mus'haf and the Mus'haf was gathered. But later on, lots of people came to Islam, become Muslim. People who are not Arab comes Muslim. And the recitation was sort of different from one place to another. There was a confusion in the rank. Second gathering took place at the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. So the second gathering, when he gathered, and he took the Mus'haf, which was left with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar al-Khattab, when Abu Bakr died, that Mus'haf went to Umar. And Umar, when he died, he put it with his daughter, and his daughter, she kept that Mus'haf, and then Uthman asked for that Mus'haf to be the Mus'haf al-Imam. From that, is to check, and they've written one Mus'haf, and he burnt all other Mus'ahif, because it got maybe different recitations or different ways. And he made that Mus'haf al-Imam in the way it is written, it would accommodate for all types of recitations. In the way it is written, it accommodate for all types of recitations. For example, Maliki and Maliki. You find, for example, a person who leads you, if uh, he's an Algerian, or one of these people come from the uh, areas where they uh, read by or recite by Warsh, instead of saying Maliki, they say Maliki. Now, Maliki, if you have seen it written in the Fatiha, is Meem Lam Kaf. And then there is a little alif small there. So you could read it Maliki, and you could read it what? Maliki. So the writing of the Uthmani <coughs> Mus'haf is written to accommodate all that recitation. Coming back now to the last thing they said, that is writing and documenting the hadith. It has a root, it traces itself to the Prophet ﷺ. When one of the companions 
was told by the kuffar, the Qushrikun, the Munafiqun, he said, what are you doing? You're writing everything that comes out from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam? You know, he sometimes he gets mad, he gets sort of uh, enraged, he, he gets, uh, you know, he's a human being, so you write everything from his mouth? How can he do that? He's a human being. He might say something, you know, you're not supposed to write it. So he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Master Chief said, Oh, Ktob, write for verily, whatever comes from it, nothing but the haqq. Haqq only. Truth. Active. Oh, Ktob, don't worry. Don't listen to them. But in general, the Prophet Sallam did not tell them to write the hadith as much as he had emphasized to write what? Why? Because there would be no mixing. But the hadith was written, but not as many ascribes to write the hadith as or write in the Quran. Why? Because of the mixing. Now, after the Quran has been sealed, after the Quran is finished, so there is no fear upon that. And that is why we say the hadith was written and we have a principle to trace ourselves to. And it's not a bid'ah. Jazahumullahu khaira for those who had documented the hadith and for the hadith, alhamdulillah, now we had these people who are scholars that would filterize and you will never able to add a word a word on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. they will know it who is he coming from and who had said it his biography how did he was he good or not was he truthful or not was he a liar or not was he a memorizing person or not we talked about Hanifa you remember Abu Hanifa the great man the person who we can't have any doubt about mashallah his scrupulous about Zwara when it came to hadith, because it wasn't strong in his memorization, because the hadith, they've got their own scale by which they, they would differentiate. They said that Abu Hanifa, when he comes into the chain, we don't consider it to be authentic unless it has come from another person <coughs> because of his memorization. Look at that. Even though they say, <laughs> We are like kids compared to Abu Hanifa and fiqh. Yet, they are just people. They put the dots on the right letters they don't put the dots on different letters i'm saying by this what i mean by this is that some people they would exaggerate in the way they talk about their scholars to the extent they make them infallible this bid'ah when did they come out in the life of the muslims and what are the reasons for them number that is one when did they start ibn taymiyyah in his majmu'i fatawa he says no for a fact that most of the bid'ah it happened at the last era of the Khulafa al Rashidin, the last era of the four right godly Khalifa. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, he who lives amongst you, he would see a lot of differences. Then hold on to the Sunnah of mine and the Sunnah of the Khulafa al Rashidin. The first bid'ah came out Al Khawarij, Al Shia, Al Qadariya, Al Irja. When Uthman was killed, Khawarij came out. And then at the end of the companion's era, like Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, Jabir, and others, the Qadariya came. If you remember the hadith of Sayyid al Muslim, when those Qadariya came and asked Umar al Khattab, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no knowledge of what has taken place, that everything initiates itself by itself. There's no fate. So that was the first bid as well in Qadar. And then, the, then after that, the Qadariya came, the Murjia. And we have explained the Murjia in the classes of Murjia. Uh, in the classes of Usul Sunnah, and then Al Jahmiyyah, which was to be in the last stage or the era of the followers, that is after the death of Abd Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, and that was at the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, uh, and it came out from Khurasan, and it's one of the worst and most evil bid'ah. As for the bid'ah of the birth, celebration of the birth of the Prophet, ﷺ, it came, at, as I said, in the late century of the fourth century, and the Fatimis had done that from the Shia. All these bid'ahs came out, as I said, and when the Sahaba were present, like for example the bid'ah of Qadariya, all of them denied it, and then as well the bid'ah al-Ihtizal came out, and then also came out as well the bid'ah of the Tasawwuf and Sufiyya, and building upon graves and so on and so forth. Now the place where it came out, we say that it is different from one place to another. Ibn Taymiyyah says, that the big places that the companions had lived into and where the knowledge came out and Imam came out and emerged are to be five. Mecca, Medina, and Iraq, 
and a sham. From it, the Quran came out. From it came out the Quran, the Hadith, and the Fiqh, and the Ibadah, or whatever follows from the religion. And also came out Bid'ah, except for the Medina. For example, the Kufa, which is in Iraq, Shi'ism, Irja, came out and spread from there. From Basra, it is mentioned as well from Iraq, by the way, Kufa and Basra. It is two, two places, five places. Basra, the Qadariya, Al Itizal, also Sufism, or I could say ascetism. Uh, ascetism, Zul, which is corrupted one and be prevalent. As for Fiyad Sham, we have Nasibiyya, the ones who hated the family of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the opposite of Shia. Shia, the extreme in the love, and those are the extreme in the hatred. And the Shia call us to be Nasibiyya, but we're not. We love the family of the Prophet. As for the Jahmiyyah, came out from the Khurasan. Right. As for the reasons why we have the bid'ah, and this is a very important issue, we say al-jahl, ignorance regarding ahkam al-sharia, al-jahl, and we have said every time the time goes and goes further, the people will be away from the message of Islam, and then their knowledge will decrease and the ignorance will increase, <coughs> knowledge will decrease and ignorance will decrease. Knowledge will decrease, sorry, and ignorance will. Knowledge will decrease, and in knowledge, and ignorance will dec will increase. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, "Inna Allah la yaqbalu al-ilm antizaa'an." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would not take the knowledge by taking it out like this from the chests of the people, but He would take the knowledge by passing death upon the scholars until He will leave no scholar. Then the people will take heads which are ignorance. They will be asked and they will give fatwa upon no knowledge. They will be misguided and misguiding. So nothing will fight the bid'ah except for what? <coughs> knowledge and the knowledgeables. The knowledge and the scholars. So if there is no knowledge and there is no scholars, then it is a chance for the bid'ah to go what? Prevalent and to spread just like the fire spray is spreading into the haystack. Second issue it is following the desire. For verily, the one who keeps away the book and the sunnah, he is definitely follower of the desires and the winds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Surah Al-Qasas, <coughs> فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَكْ If they don't respond to you, O Prophet, فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّمَا يَتَّبِعُونَ أَهْوَاهُمْ Then know that they are following their winds and desires. وَمَنْ أَضَلُّ مِنَّنِ اتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ بِغَيْرِ هُدًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ And who is more misguided than the one who had followed his whims and desires without the guidance of Allah. Also in Surah Al-Jafi, Allah says, Don't you see the one who had taken his, God, his whims and desire to be his God? And Allah had misguided him what he was knowing. And he had put a seal on his hearing. And in his heart. And he made on his eyes a ghishawa, a barrier. Who's going to guide him before Allah? No one. Third reason, blind following. This is being fanatic. And this is, it will cause a barrier between you and following the proof and recognizing the haqq. Wallahi, if you are a blind follower, this person calls himself, I'm a Hanafi, no matter what. I'm a Shafi, no matter what. I'm a Hanbali, no matter what. He's putting these men's to be infallible. He's made a barrier between him and following the proof and also knowing the haqq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا That if he was said to them, follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed, بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَانَ Verily, we only follow what our fathers, our forebearers, they used to be upon. So this is the blind followers. These, these days, they follow a certain madhab 
and when they call to the book of the Sunnah and leave what is opposing the book of the Sunnah, they will say, our madhab says, our sheikh says. <coughs> and number four is to emulate the kuffar. That's another reason. Which is one of the great reasons that make the person goes into bid'ah. As in Hadith Abi Waqid al-Laytin Sahih al-Bukhari, that we have seen, he had said, after the Battle of Hunayn, we went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we were close to Kufr. We just left Kufr. We just embraced Islam. And we passed by a low tree where the Mushrikun used to use it for hanging their weapons uh, for uh, going to the battle, like recharging. Yeah? And also they used to slaughter next to that tree. So we have seen that and it's, it was called that and what? The tree was called that one. So when we pass by another tree, which is similar to that one, we said, Messenger of Allah, make us that one what like they have that, that one. Exactly the same that we have, they have. Make us another tree so we could really put our weapons as well, okay, as a booster for us when we go and fight. So the Prophet he said, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than what you say. Allahu Akbar. Inna has sana or inna has surah. Both is correct. Verily, this is the way. This is the, the way that you're going to be following. You have said by the one in whose hand is my soul. That is, like the children of Israel said to Musa alayhi salam. Make us a God like they have a God. He had said to the Musa alayhi salam that you verily are people who are ignorant. Surat al-Araf. And the Tarkabunna sadana man kana qabilakum. Verily you are going to follow the footpath of the methodology of the ones before you. They said, Al-Yahuda wa Nasara. Christian of the Jews, he said, who else, who else? <coughs> so in this hadith, he made the emulation of the kuffar is the one that made Banu Israel to ask this despicable request from Musa alayhi salam. That is, to make them a god to worship. You know, the Banu Israel, when they saw that these people worship a god, make us a god, but they have a god. So emulating the home, the Banu Israel was emulating the home, the disbelievers. And now the prophets, companions, and us at the moment, we're doing the same thing. But the Prophet companions, Abu Waqlati, he said, please give us an excuse. Because we just embraced Islam about two, three months, by the way. Three months before. Because the conquest of Mecca took place. The 10,000 of the companions, these are not the one who talk it. These are the new 2,000 that joined in, in the force. At-Tulaqa. Those 2,000, one of them is Abu Waqlati. He just, just, just left Kufr, just, you know, days ago. So please, they have an excuse for us that we have done this, we are wrong. But yet, even that, they did not go by themselves and made themselves a, a, a what? Low tree. They had to ask for Prophet I don't know if it's wrong or right. Did they, these people who make the maulid, ask the Prophet Wasallam? Did they? they? Haven't asked the Prophet Wasallam. They have followed whims and desire. And they are emulating, that's what I'm just saying when I said that the birth celebration is actually... To imitate the kuffar, the Christians, they celebrate Isa alayhi salam. How come these people celebrate their Isa? We don't celebrate our the birth of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. Right. So we have find we find ourselves the celebration of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is actually because of most likely because of the sin and of course added to it, which is ignorance and blind following and, and whims and desire, all of that. But it depends upon the category. But I would say it is most likely it is. That one, <coughs> and that is making these festivals as well, other festivals, not just that, that Shabarat and also other ones, uh, Nehruz, whatever, and also building the uh, buildings on top of the graves and also the innovations that goes along with the funeral processions. What is the people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah position from the Mubtaliyah? And looking at the time now, and I'm seeing it's passing nine o'clock. So I will just finish with this, and I will maybe have a second section for this next week, which is a refutation, because the refutation is another, another about 40, 45 minutes. So I'm just get building in here on top of that. So if you don't mind, next week we'll continue as well. All right. So I, I didn't know that I'm going to take a long time with this, but this is like uh, it's a build a structure, building a structure for the sake of you to refute all the arguments regarding this issue. So I will today we'll just make a make a foundations of the bid and so on and so forth. But next week we'll talk about the specific refutation of those Sufis when they say 
How come you're not celebrating the birth of the Prophet ﷺ? Who is the one who's standing for you on the Sirat? He's the one who's going to save you from the hellfire. He's the one who put his blood for you. What are you? So are you saying to me you're not celebrating the birth of the Prophet? Shame on you. That's what they say. They play with the emotions. So we're going to, inshallah, play with their emotions. We're going to really put an end for their emotions. We're going to say to them, no, we love the Prophet more than you claim that you claim that you love the Prophet. We are the ones who are, we never, we never mention something. You say, Qal Allah, Qal Rasulullah. Allah said, the Prophet said, Whereas you, my Sheikh said, and my Sheikh said, my Sheikh said, and my Sheikh said, we say, Allah, Qal Rasulullah. That is what we are saying. We love the Prophet <coughs> so much. We love him more than ourselves, and our families, and our kids, and our wives. He is the most dearest person at the same time. He's a prophet. He's a human being. We don't exceed further than that. And we say that he is a person who does not die. A person who is at the moment, uh, he is, uh, you should be calling him and making supplication to him. We don't say that. For very he's a prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The people of Al-Sunnah regarding the people of Al-Bid'ah, what do they do? Well, their reputation is well known. In Sahih al-Bukhari, on the authority of Ammud Darda, she said, Abu Darda, he entered the house and he was so enraged. I said to him, what is happening to you? He said, Wallahi, Abu Darda had lived to see the innovation that took place after the death of the Prophet ﷺ and the death of most of the companions, Abu Darda. He said, Wallahi, I know nothing. I know nothing from... The, from the religion that the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad had came up with them, except that I could see them praying together. That's it. Do you understand? That he came to the masjid, he looked at the masjid, and he said, nothing that is from the deen that the Prophet ﷺ came with, nothing from the Islam, nothing from what Muhammad ﷺ came up with, I know except that they're praying together. Other than that, all of it is bid'ah, being added. He was so enraged. Amr ibn Yahya, he said, I've heard my father. That is... Umar ibn Hisul, that his father from the father of his from his father from his father, grandfather that he said we were sitting at the gate of the door of the house of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud just before the prayer of the Fajr and we were waiting for him if he goes out we'll go with him Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came he said did Abu Abdul Rahman Abdullah ibn Mas'ud come out yet he said, we said no we're still waiting so he just sat with us and he waited for him to come out. As soon as he came out, he said, Ah, Abu Abdul Rahman. Oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, which is Abdullah ibn Masood. This is just after, just few months, after a few years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is in the Kufa, place where the bid'ahs came out from. He said, Oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, I have seen in the masjid such and such, something which I have, did not, you know, did not, sort of, I, something which I denied. Something I did not, I wasn't really approved of. But I did not see anything except for good. Alhamdulillah. How can it be something good, but I did not approve of? I did not see before. That means something I haven't seen at the time of the Prophet of Allah. But it's nothing to do with, like for example, drinking alcohol or fornication. It's something to do with, you know, Alhamdulillah, something good. So he said to him, what did you see? He said, well, if you live, you're going to see it. <laughs> Abu Musa said, if you live, you're going to see it. I have seen in the masjid, people who are in circles halaqat and they were waiting for the prayer in each circle there's a man and in their hands there is hasa pebbles and the man is telling them the sheikh say a hundred times Allah akbar they say Allah akbar Allah akbar Allah akbar Allah akbar a hundred times say la ilaha illallah a hundred times la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah a hundred times say subhanallah a hundred times subhanallah subhanallah a hundred times so Abu Musa, so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is asking Abu Musa, what did you say to them? He said, well, I didn't say anything. I'm waiting for your decision. Because he's a greater senior companion to tell you. If you are not more knowledgeable than the person who you're going to ask a fatwa from, this is from the etiquette to wait for his decision. Um, I didn't say anything. I'm waiting for you. But you have to tell him. He had told him. So he said, didn't you command them? Didn't you order them to count their sins that instead of Allah Akbar, one, two, say, one sin, two sin, three sin, four sin, hundred sin, no, one sin, two sin, count their sins. And guaranteed for them that there will be nothing deducted from their hasanat. I oh, know, I didn't say that. So he left, and we left with him. Until he came into that masjid, 
and he went to one of these halaqat, to one of these circles, and he stood next to it. And one of the narrations, Sheikh al-Albani used to say that he came with a mask on. Because Allah is Allah known. As soon as they see him, they will know him. So he doesn't want to show himself. So he want to, for example, surprise them to see what they're doing before they realize that Islam Allah Masoodis will stop. As soon as he, he took the scarf, the mask off, then they have recognized Abdullah ibn Masood. So he said to them, what is this that you're doing? So he looked. And he said, verily, count your sins, and I'm guaranteeing for you, nothing will be deducted from your hasanat. Woe to you, Ummah Muhammad. Woe to you, you are the ones who claim to be the followers of Muhammad. How fast are you going to be destroyed? Those other companions are still there. And this is the close of the Prophet of Allah hasn't been sort of, the pattern hasn't been worn out. Still the clothes are there. And this is his pot, hasn't been broken. That means he hasn't died for a long time. Verily, either you are, by the one whose hair is my soul, you are better than the Prophet ﷺ. You are on a root, on a guidance, on a religion, which is better than the religion of Muhammad, or you are opening the gate of misguidance, or holding to the tail of a misguidance. He called it a cow or, a, or an animal. <coughs> he said, Oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, Wallahi, we did not intend except for good. Then he said, Verily, how many people intend good, but they will never achieve it. They will never attain it. Verily, the Prophet ﷺ talked to us about people who they used to recite Quran, and they recite Quran, but the Quran will not go beyond their collarbones here. They were stuck, they would be just from there to there. We will never go down to their hearts. And by Allah, I don't know. Maybe most of those people of the Prophet ﷺ spoke about are from you. And then he left them. Then Amr ibn Salam, the narrator of the hadith, he said, Wallahi, we have seen that most of those people who were in that circles, they used to be our oppositions, our enemies on the day of Nahrawan, fighting us with the Khawarij against Ali ibn Abi Talib. So they started with what? As Sheikh al Bani used to explain, with Budaya, in Sahat Tabi, that is small bid'ah, they call it. Small bid'ah, Budaya. They call it, they want to be bid'ah, Budaya. You know, lying, lying, little lie, like Kudayba. Uh, bid'ah is a bid'ah. Small bid'ah, look into the Budwa, the big bid'ah, which is the innovation that is to make a coup and fight your leader to see that you are upon the haq and shedding the blood of your brother is to be lawful. This is the biggest bid'ah. Ended up with a small bid'ah. The third, from as well, the narrations of the Salaf regarding this issue, a man came to the Imam Malik. He said, oh Imam Malik, where shall I come make ihram from? Well, Imam Malik is the Imam of the Medina, and the ihram, if you're coming from the Medina, is to be from the Hulifa. It's about five miles away. He said, well, from the, from the place where the Prophet ﷺ made ihram, which is the Hulifa, the man, he said, well, I want to make ihram from the grave, from the masjid itself, where the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu So the Imam Malik, he said, well, I fear upon you the fitna. <laughs> fitna? Fitna. <coughs> fitna means trial, tribulation. Fitna? Well, what type of fitna is going to happen to me? It's only a few miles on Eri. So instead of going from five miles away, you know, it's about from there to Mecca, from Medina to Mecca. That's about 250 miles. And the Miqat, which is the station from which you have to make your ihram, is about five miles away from the Medina. So what is the difference I'm going to make if I'm going to add five miles? Instead of making it from 245, I'm making it from 250 miles. What is the fitna? I'm adding only a few miles. What is the fitna? So he said to him, what more fitna do you need? Then you are thinking and believing that you have raced or discovered something which is good that the Prophet ﷺ did not command us to do, did not do himself. Do you know, you see the fitna? That you are saying that it's better to make now the ihram, not from five miles away from the Hulayfa, but actually from the masjid of the Prophet of Allah. So this is the fitna saying that you are, actually what you are saying, that the messenger of Allah, either he was falling short, or he had betrayed us, then tell us, or you are yourself better understanding than the Prophet of Allah. And all of these three, a'udhu billah, and you ended up saying that you are a God. So this is the bid'ah. So he said, this is the fitna. For verily I've heard the Prophet ﷺ, I've heard Allah Azza wa Jal say, 
فليحذر الذين يخالفون عن امره ان تصيبهم فتنه او يصيبهم عذاب اليم that is let the people who are opposing his command the command of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم let them have him a warning that the fitna will strike them and then they will have <coughs> severe torture a torment on the hereafter manhajus salaf and this is the last thing that is before we make the refutation on next week what are the manhaj of the salaf in terms of refuting the bihal bid'ah that was our stand this is how to refute ahl bid'ah our manhaj to refute ahl bid'ah is the convincing manhaj that is we bring the doubt of those people who bring it and then we analyze it and we refute it this is how the way you do it do you understand me ahl bid'ah ahl sunnah will they bring their doubts and will bring even the proofs which they look like they are against them and not like the Ahlul Bid'ah when they refute their arguments, they refute the other side. How do they do? They bring only the proofs that was what on their side. But any proof <coughs> that seems to be against them, they will hide it. Do you understand that? Ahlul Sunnah, they'll bring everything. Whatever it is the one that looks like maybe it's against them, or the one which is 100% with them, they will tackle that issue just to explain to you that what looks like is against us is not what you think. They'll bring it. They will not bring things out of context. They will not chop words here and there, which is the manhaj or the methodology or the way of Ahl Bid'ah. Alhamdulillah, Ahl Sunnah, they will bring it out. Look at that. Now we shall see, inshallah, when we refute the argument and I will show you how Ahl Bid'ah they make better nusus. They cut off the text, they take them out of context. And that is why they have made refutation against the Shia, the Khawar, the Jahmiya, the Mu'tazila, the Sha'ira, and lots of them. And uh, Shaykh al Islam al had made lots of them, Muhammad Wahab and others. And let me just now give you some names of those books from the old ones and the new ones regarding the bid'ah. Number one, Al-I'tisam, Imam al-Shatani. Number two, Iqtida al-Salat al-Mustaqeem, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Where in his book, he made this big, massive sort of chapters regarding the refutation of the bid'ah. The book of Inkar al-Hawadith wal bidah Ibn al And then Al-Hawadith wal bidah Al-Turtushi. And then Al-Ba'ith Ala Inkar Al-Bid'a Wal Hawadith Abu Sham Al-Maqdisi And from the recent books We have Al-Ibda'a Fi Madar Al-Ibda'a Ali Al-Mahfuz And Al-Sunan Wal Muqtada'at That is Muhammad Ibn Ahmad Al-Shuqayri And Al-Tahdhir Risalah Al-Tahdhir Min Al-Bid'a Al-Shaykh Al-Aziz Ibn Baz Also Al-Ibda'a Fi Kamal Al-Shab'i Wa Khatar Al-Ibda'a Al-Shaykh Ibn Uthameen and we have, mashallah, as well, a book by our Sheikh Al-Halabi, Ilm Usul Bid'ah, which is a thick book on Usul, Usul Bid'ah. And then we have a treatise by Imam Suyuti, checked by Sheikh Mashur, our Sheikh, it is Amr Bil Tiba'a wa Nahi Al Bid'ah. And also we have a Tamasuk with Sunan Al Tahdir Al Bid'ah, Lil Dhahabi, Wallahu Ta'ala. And this is, now the Dhahabi, this one you could just add it to the ones which is the old ones. Sorry about that. Khair, inshallah. So we'll stop here inshallah and we leave the for you to ask any question but as I said there will be a specific refutation to all the shubhats of those Sufis and I was chosen uh, by the way this shubhat uh, being uh, the rudud of it has been done by a number of scholars and some of them is being even translated into English and I will tell you about it inshallah now the what's worse uh, what's the difference between a sin and a bid'ah what's worse what is worse, a sin or a bid'ah? You know, this is a question being answered by the scholars. They say that al-bid'ah, the diniya, the bid'ah and the deen, is closer to the shaitan than al-ma'asi shahwadi, than the ma'asi, the ma'asi which is based upon lust. Because you, the ma'asi, the sin is based upon what? Lust. Whereas the bid'ah is to do with your religion. So they say al bidah al diniyya ahabu ila iblis bin al ma'asi shahwadi. And this is the same of Shaykh al Islam al and others. So definitely, we want to be away from both. But if I had no choice, except to do one with one of them, I had no choice, I mean, we're going to be compelled, then I would do the what? The ma'asi. The reason behind this is obvious. That even though the, the bidah looks nicer, like these people were doing with the beads, subhanallah, subhanallah, the bidah. Is better than the person who's, for example, fornicating. Sorry, worse, better for the shaitan. 
more love of than the person who was fornicating because of the person who's fornicating or drinking alcohol or doing any sin, burglary or whatever. And you ask him, fear Allah, why are you fornicating? He said, yeah, ask dua, inshallah, for me, I'll stop, I'm ready. You know. But he would never say to you, I'm fornicating to get closer to Allah. He would never say that to you. Whereas the person who's bid'ah, you tell him, brother, fear Allah. What do you fear Allah? I'm doing subhanallah, alhamdulillah, do you? Allah, Allah, Allah. <laughs> I'm not fornicating, I'm not drinking alcohol. I'm just shaking my head, Allah, Allah. I'm getting closer to Allah. So how can you use me to be, get closer to Allah and I'm saying Allah all the time? That's how it is. So it's impossible for the person of bid'ah to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what the Prophet said, Inna Allah ahtajazat tawbata am sahibi kulli bid'ah. That is Allah had prevented every innovator, made a barrier between the innovator and repentance. Hatta yarji'an bid'ah. Unless he stops from his bid'ah. Otherwise, there will be a barrier because it's impossible for him to repent. And I'm saying impossible, not 100%, but it's impossible and it's very difficult. And that's why you find the people who are in bid'ah, very difficult to leave the bid'ah. So they left it, alhamdulillah. And most likely they were not going to be cured from it completely. That's the problem. So when they leave their bid'ah, they're never 100%. So a person, for example, coming from a, a partisan or a sect, coming to the Salafi, you still find him the trace there in him. Subhanallah. Isn't it? And you find, for example, like uh, Al-Imam Abu Hassan Al-Ash'ari. Abu Hassan Al-Ash'ari, he had transferred himself into three stages. Stage number one, pure Mu'tazim. Stage number two, Sayyid ibn Kullab. Stage number three, which is to do the Madhab Imam Ahmad, which is Ahl Sunnah. But he wasn't 100%. Even though the third one is Mashallah, but he's not 100%. But the people who attribute himself to Ash'ari, they are attributing to Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari in his what? Second stage. When he was. So they should call him Ash'ari Ash'ari, they should call him Madhab ibn Kullab. Not the Ash'ari. Abu al-Ash'ari, nothing to do with them. And that's why the Maqarat al-Islamiyin, uh, they don't really say that he has done it. Or Kitab al-Ibani that he hasn't done it. They don't say that this books because they books, these books totally, okay, annihilate and destroy the Madhab of Ash'ari. They don't believe that it belongs to Al-Imam Abu Al-Hasan Ash'ari. Now, Tafadbal, uh, Uncle. Sheikh, I would like to ask a question which I have asked before, but I want to ask for the benefit of the new brothers. And yes, the yes. Some people, to celebrate the, the, the birthday of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they don't cook food and sweet, and they bring it to, to my house. While I, I refuse to take it, and I explain why I don't want to take it, they get very upset. Uh, right. Uh, the question is, I'm going to repeat it for the sake of assistance. <coughs> that is, the person, when he is, for example, having some relatives or friends, they're sending him some uh, food which is made for that occasion. And the uncle is saying, I'm not accepting that, but that would result into a lot of hatred and a lot of uh, anger and so on and so forth. So, how can I tackle this issue? I think we have talked about this issue, and because you have asked me about this issue, when we talked about the celebration of that, Christmas, if you remember. We talked about Christmas, celebrating Christmas, and we discussed this issue about receiving presents at Christmas. <coughs> so can anybody tell me, for the regard of Christmas, just to see, receiving a present on Christmas from your neighbor, what are the conditions for it, if it's to be halal, if it is halal in the first place? Okay, fadal, no, no, you're not from Luton. Only looting people here. Now, yes? Uh, can you say that for Christmas, if the gift is not specific for the occasion, so you mentioned like candles or something? That Next, excellent. So the, this, the, that, that thing that's been given is not specific to aid that festival, like candles, <coughs> or like bills, or like a Christmas tree. That's number one. Number two, yes? It's like proving the, if the gift, or if that action, approving the celebration. I don't understand that. Condition, don't the if it doesn't approve their celebration, like what? then you can accept it. It's not the same or the same point. Uh, the main reason same point. For giving the, uh, present, if the main reason is for Christmas or celebrating <coughs> Christmas, then I shouldn't take it. Like yeah. That. Okay, it's the first point, which is your point, it's the point for the brothers, that is not to be aiding 
the Christmas. That's like what you said, Kendall. Number two, yes? You have to explain to your family. Why explain to your family that they are not taking it because you are approving such a festival. <laughs> Number three? Huh? If, if they give you a gift, for example, like an MP3, you can take it for the sake of Dao and become a pilgrim. For the sake of the Dao. If you take it only for the sake of the Dao. Number four? It's not a sacrifice. Is that right? Yes, it's not a food being done for that occasion. So if it is not a food done for the occasion, if you're doing it for the sake of the Dao, you're explaining to your family what it is, and it's not aiding the festival, then you could take that present. The same thing with the doing with the Mawlid al But we are more stricter with our clan than we are with the disbelievers. We are more stricter. Because the reason they are our clan. Okay? <coughs> Any food. No, it's not. So it's a condition. Food. If it's food, it's slaughtered for that sake. So it's, for example, sheep, or whatever, we don't take it. I would say even cakes made for that, because it's going to be approved in such a thing, don't take it. So we want to, and, uh, and the best way of building bridges with these people is not to accept anything. Because you accept something, then you will, it's not really a, a sort of, I would say, down. It's actually, you will say, oh, thank you very much. But at least you left your Wahhabism. And you became, you know, tolerant, moderate. So I would say, uncle, when it comes to compromise, religion, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> with the relationship that you're trying to build with these people Allah comes first but your way of rejecting it has to be in the most you could say uh, least harmful way you don't really harm the people in the way that you reject it so I'm not going to throw the food in their face <laughs> I say don't you ever show my face for example all of the time don't never turn to me with this oh, bida you are in Jahannam <laughs> that is another way to go to Allah so Bit by bit, inshallah, I think he will accept and try all the time to present the sunnah in the sunnah way. For verily, al-haqq wa Haqq, truth, is to be heavy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, even this amana, which is a religion, the amana, if it falls into the mountains, the mountains will be even to, almost can, can't bear to take it. Okay, so you have to really be careful of when you pass the message these people to pass it in the most pleasantable or pleasant way. Wallahi, wallahi, inna nafsa jubilat ala an tusghiya liman ahsana ilayhi. Listen to this. Verily, the human soul is being manufactured, being created to listen to the one who is kind to it. This is the same from the scholars who have taken it from them. That this soul of yours even if it was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to me, and he presented his message with harsh, or harshness, I would not accept it from him. He has to be kind to me to accept it from him. And it's Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not you. al and min hablik. And if you were to be harsh, harsh-hearted, they will leave you. And those are the ones who are going to leave you. Who the companions, the best, the best of the best after the best. So they will leave him. How about us? We definitely will leave him. So it has, you have to present your message in the best of ways. And how better than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man comes to him to take the debt. And maybe it just was due. And it could have been due just a bit days before when he came. He was saying to him really hard words. Why? Why didn't you give me that as soon as possible? Why didn't you give me the loan? Why didn't you give me? And the companion, the companion is almost gonna beat him up. He said, "Leave him." For inna li sahib al haqi ma qala. For verily, the person who's got a right, he has a saying to go ahead with it. Let him say what he likes, because he's hot and he's hot, and you know he's why he's the prophet. So let him. So if somebody you lent him some money and you were, uh, for example, so if you if you if you borrowed somebody from somebody else. If not, you were not on time, and that person it was a bit harsh on you. Why didn't you bring it? You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treat you the way that you are. And so you have to accept that. <coughs> okay, accept that because he's got, he's got a right. So, inna li sahib al haqqi maqala. Now, tafaddal. Are we allowed to shred Islamic documents? Because if it cuts it into, say, separate, say you had the word Allah, but it cuts the, word, the letters off, so it's not Allah anymore. Is that, is that allowed? Or is that not allowed? Right, the question is that if I have, for example, a page like this, and the page like this, it's got Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all over the page, okay? 
So what is the best way of for me to get rid of it if I don't want it? Now, what I can't I could tell you that you're not allowed is to leave it like this and put it in the bin like that. It's not allowed. Because it's going to be lots of dirt and filth and so on and so forth. And this is, uh, uh, you're not really actually uh, holding the symbols of Allah to be the high. فَإِنَّهَا ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ That is the person who holds the symbols of Allah to be high. This is the signs of a, okay, pious, of piety in the heart. So this person is not allowed to do like this. <coughs> what am I allowed to do it? <coughs> okay. And the ways of the scholars before used to say, either you burn it, or you dig a hole in the ground and you put it there. But these days, there's other ways as well. Let's say, for example, if it was a uh, pencil, you could erase it. If it's, for example, uh, ink that can be dissolved, you could put it in the water. But there is as well now shredders. Can I shred that where I could make, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the word itself, and make it into letters instead of this? If that shredder is into the millimeters that would really come into that word, because some of the, let's say for example, I've written that into 11, the uh, scale, what do you call it, scale there? Font, font size, 11. Maybe 11 is too, too, too tiny for that shredder to take. But if we made it 14 or 15, maybe it will come into this matter. So if it's a uh, 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 and it's coming separate, it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. But anyway, you have to respect the Arabic language. So, the Arabic language, you, you could, no problem, you could really tear it and run, but the Arabic language, I mean, for example, I wouldn't like you to wipe your, for example, window screen in the house with, for example, an Arabic newspaper. I don't like that. Okay? Regardless whether it's got Allah into it or not. If it's got Allah, it's haram. Because you're using Allah, the words in it. And, and I'm pretty sure that any newspaper, it will have the name of Allah. Not because it's religious, because lots of people call Abdullah, Abdullah, Abdullah. So you have Abdullah, you can't clean with it. So clean with it, you know, non-Arabic. Okay, newspapers. Non-Arabic newspapers. And the Arabic language, I remember I went to one of the Shiuk's houses. Uh, the Shiuk doesn't know anything about English. But his doorman outside, he says, welcome. <laughs> welcome, big one. So I said, is it because of the Arabic? He said, yes. I'm not going to say marhaban or ahlan wa sahlan. You can just stop, you put your foot into the Arabic language itself. I said, welcome. You could step on welcome, no problem. <laughs> when, you're, when you're praying and you're, in, and you're like, are you allowed to give dua? Are you allowed to say dua in your head? Sorry? Are you allowed to ask? Are you allowed to ask for forgiveness and stuff like that? You know, when you're praying, after you recite, when you're reciting, are you allowed to like... It's a jude. It's a jude, yes. And the sujood, yeah. 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 are you trying to... Are you allowed to like, are you allowed to ask forgiveness and stuff like after you just something you say? Any person in the sujood or any part of his prayer, he needs to make the adhkar that the Prophet ﷺ had given. Even the supplication where the Prophet ﷺ, he said the closest which the person can be in his salah is when he's making sujood. Let him increase in his dua. Increase in his dua it means a dua that is this hadith targeted, targeting the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. So if you know some of the du'a, because of the du'a, the Prophet of Allah is collected. Because he's got the jawami al kali Few words, but mashallah, vasa means. But if you don't know, we know how to add your own du'a, but we will say to you, don't make that as a habit. Meaning, let's say that you have made this du'a, oh Allah, uh, let's say in English, oh Allah, give me life, and give me sunnah, Keep me away from the, for example, the elevation. Then the following day, or the following prayer, you're trying to actually exert a lot of effort to bring out the same words that you have said, Oh Allah, give me life. And, uh, and what, what did they say before? And you make it now a supplication. Instead of the supplication of the Prophet, it becomes a bid'ah. Yeah. Do you understand that? So if it's general, you don't stick to it. But remember, priority goes to the dua of the Prophet. Okay? Any questions here from the side? This is about uh, the dua of uh, morning and evening to protect the children. We, the three surahs that we recite and, and blow on them. 
we have more than one children, do we do individually on each children or one blow and then do the recitation and then uh, what over all of them? We don't do any of this on the children. The children, and remember please, you can't read for them either Kursi. You could only teach the one who teaches. You don't do that to the children. You do it in yourself. So, I, so you're asking me something that was already based upon that I already say that you do that to the children. No. The children are children. So the one who knows, you teach him either Kursi. The one who knows, you teach him how to blow to himself. But you do the blowing for him and you do the either Kursi on him. There is a supplication, which is, that is when he says that if you have children, it is to prevent the evil eye from going on to them. Bismillah, u'idhuka bi kalimat Allah al-tamah min kulli shaytan al-tamah wa min kulli ayin al-lamah. And if it's two, u'idhukuma bi kalimat Allah al-tamah. If it's more than two, then you have to use two, and then after you finish, you know, two, if you have two, other two, so you're putting it right on the thing. So, how many children have you got? It's going to be there a long time. <laughs> If you are like my friend, he's got 40. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah, 4 zero, 40. And I don't know how long you're going to take. <laughs> That's 20 times. It's a little bit cute. Cute, yeah. But uh, I'll tell you what. Yani, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't take about 10 seconds. 15 seconds maximum. So 20 times for 15 seconds. That comes in come even 5 minutes. So it's not really... Uh, Something, but it's enjoying it, you know. Imagine an army of 40 people in front of you. That's all of your children. So imagine that he could make his own speech, his own lesson, his own class, his own. She could. They are more than you. <laughs> I don't know how many people they are, but <laughs> no. Where are you from? Where is Anna Mashufnak? We haven't seen you for a long time. Yalla, tafadl. Yes, we'll give you a yellow. Yeah, cool. in terms of the order of the surahs, all of it being organized at the time of the Prophet Because every time the Messenger will receive the revelation, he would receive as well from Jibreel where to put it. So he would tell the companion, put it and such and such in Surah Kana. Okay, so the order of the surahs is a revelation. So it's being revealed, it's not being done by the companions. So then, for example, they put the Fatiha and the Baqarah, no, it's being done by the Prophet. Even you know that the segmented the segmented revelation on the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it was one of the signs of his prophethood and one of the signs that is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you look at the Quran at the moment, it's well woven together. It looks like it came one go, but actually it came one in segments. And each segment came for a specific occasion. So the one who has done it must be something that he knows what is taking place. So if it was somebody who doesn't know what is taking place, you know, an equation will tell you this, and another equation will tell you but how can I put it together and make out of it something that would sound not one-sided, nice. So, so the segment? Of, so in terms of hip-wise, there was organized order. Oh yeah, it's organized in the order. to work, you the same thing, are you traveling or not? So for example, let's say you're an air pilot, you commute to work, you go to India, you're not traveling there? Uh, maybe like, if it's London, if you travel to London. Then. So now we're coming down to the distance, so not, not to work. <laughs> we have left the work. What I actually mean is like, um, if I work in London, and I travel to London every day, see, and I, that class as, uh, I'm just saying to you, traveling is a traveling. It doesn't matter how many, you do the traveling. So regardless how many, so I just said to you, 
oh, we're going to have an answer of something. Go to the extreme. The extreme is an air pilot. When you go to London, you take about, about one hour, maybe. Or less. But when one hour, I could, if I'm an air pilot, I could you know, go to Scotland, is not it? And this is my work every day. I'm going to Scotland, coming back, going to Scotland. I'm a traveler, still this travel. But if you are in your traveling, you become, uh, uh, you are resident. I'll give you an example, uh, which is the captain of a ship. <coughs> captain of a ship. Now his ship is his house as well. You know that. He's got his own bedroom, even better than his house. <laughs> So if he stays in one place, he's, he's, so he's in his house, even he's traveling, so that is his house, moving, mobilized house. So that is not, the, but the, the, the air pilot, he's not, he's traveling and he's never been settled. So he goes to a hotel, he stays for four days, five days, and then you can fly back in. So it doesn't matter how many times you travel, as long as you are still a traveler, you're in London, unless you've got another wife there settle there in the house. So London is a traveling, that is different from one person to another. It depends upon now what you classify traveling. So some people classify London is not traveling. Some people classify it is traveling. I'm going to ask it, I want to ask it based upon what, please. You could classify traveling or traveling. And that's when you get into the zone of the people that don't know what they say. How do you say, some of them say, I consider myself, I've had travel <coughs> before the river, I'm not a traveler. Behind the river, uh, so I'm a traveler. So if he stops, for example, before the bridge, he's not a traveler. He crossed the bridge, which is about 500 yards, I don't know, 100 yards, he's a traveler. I, <laughs> I don't know. So it is, doesn't matter. If I go with you, for example, me and you, we go to a place like London. I consider myself a traveler, and you don't consider you a traveler, no. Because you're not convinced as a traveler. So I will shorten my prayer, and you will not shorten your prayer. No problem. Do you understand that? But if me and you gone to Scotland, both of us would shorten the prayer. Why? Because we have no doubt that we're going for traveling here. So there are some areas which I would say differs because the difference among the scholars. And I'm telling you, there are more than 21 sayings regarding the traveling. So, if it is the case regarding the issue of traveling, is a true of traveling really, even the Sheikh al Ghani himself, Rahimahullah, he said the conclusion I've arrived to that is to do with the traveling, that there's two issues. It is what the people consider to be traveling. Who are the people here? Who are the people? The Muslims, the habits of the Muslims. And number two, it is you yourself, inside yourself. Are you traveling or are you not traveling? Both these two conditions. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Let's have a final question, please. We've got to ask a question. Haven't you asked a question? Go on. How many days fast is traveling? Well, that's a difference among the scholars. We have more than 20 saying as well for that. What? To be considered as well. how many days? Some say four days. But as long as you are a traveler, you are not settled, you're a traveler. Meaning, if you are a person who's coming to a place where you're going to be renting a place and you're going to be buying your utensils, you're going to be buying your quilts, and you're not a traveler, are you? So the first day, you're not a traveler. You have to be what? Completing the prayer. But if you went there and you don't know you're going to be in this hotel and with this brother and with this brother and renting a, an apartment here and you don't know if you're going to stay and you just... We call it hala to suffer. You got this hala. Hala means the status of travel. You're not subtle, then you are a traveler regardless how long you stay. Do you understand that? This is a person who isn't subtle. So Ibn Umar in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan uh, is in the southern part of Russia. Six months there. Six months he was traveling. Now, the reason behind because the snow blocked the route. And at that time, there lots of snow at that time. Lots of snow. Now, I am asking, from the amount of snow that he could see, wouldn't he say that at least that snow would take about at least a week to melt? I'm asking. So, even he had said, I'm definitely going to stay at least for a week. Till the snow is going to melt, yet he did not complete his prayer. Because he was saying, as soon as I this finish, I'm going to go. I'm a traveler, and I'm not really hooking to myself into this country. I'm just finished my what I wanted to finish, and he's leaving back. There's another narration which is not unauthentic. <coughs> Anas was in two years in Bilal Sham. But Wallahu ta'ala alam, subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashadu